Um, but that means that combined, more than 400 billion was stolen or wasted. That is actually more than the government spent on healthcare during the pandemic. Hey guys, welcome to the Base Politics Podcast. I'm Hannah Cox here with Rob Palumbo. This week, the worst taxpayer of our, of our lifetimes, Biden's new CDC director, a woke author self-censors, and so much more. Let's jump in. Kicking us off this week, it looks like I got absolutely vetoed last week when it comes down to whether our audience wants to hear about aliens or not. <laughs> I think I'm yes. absolutely alone. I have some beef. We are not alone, but you are. Um, I have some beef to pick with you, Hannah, because our audience on YouTube uh, said, here, I'm just going to read comments. More UFO talk. Agree with Brad on the aliens and UFOs. I'm interested in the alien stuff as well. Yes, more UFO stuff. In <laughs> interested in the base report, aliens and the government with Brad. Uh, another one. I'm interested in aliens and have been since I was a kid. Another one, definitely want to hear about the whistleblower. Another one, I'm interested in your thoughts on the UFO stuff, Brad. So I have good news, folks. Uh, I will be doing a bonus episode with my friend Tom, who is a military reporter with extensive knowledge on UFOs. We'll be breaking down the new whistleblower testimony and developments, uh, and you can stay tuned for that this Sunday. I won't be boring Hannah with the details, but I will be giving the people what they want uh, oh, and working around her uh, unsophisticated and boring taste. I just have to say, you guys are a whole bunch of nerds, but I appreciate you filling this void for Brad and giving him an outlet so that I don't have to listen to it. So I'm sure you guys will have. also said they want to hear your thoughts on Vanderpump Rules. So <laughs> that, that I can go all day on. But, uh, well, I guess aliens uh, might not be the weirdest thing that happened this year. It sounds like we might have a former president going to jail. I don't know. When I saw Back to the Future as a kid and I pictured, like, what life would be like around now, I thought we'd have flying cars, hoverboards, food that, like, could, you know, pizzas that could be made in the microwave in, like, a minute. But we didn't get any of that. Now we're just getting weird, weird futuristic things. So what's going on We got TikTok, Trump. Trump and aliens yeah this is lame <laughs> <laughs> really do you think trump's gonna go to jail we have to talk about it quickly honestly yeah you i think, think and I, yeah i do i think he i think he will end up well at least how about this cell. in a jail cell i do yeah not just convicted like you think he'll serve time i think definitely convicted i don't know if he'll serve time but i would lean toward yes that's so i think it's i think it's really damning stuff i think the best argument in his defense is not actually a defense of his actions, but simply a whataboutism of they let Hillary get away with it. Um, but honestly, I would say that both Hillary and Trump probably should have been convicted and sent to jail over this kind of thing. I mean, I guess I I don't have deep feelings on this, to be clear. I remember when the first impeachment was going on with Trump and Justin Amash voted um, for impeachment and put out this whole expose on why, and it made a lot of Republicans really mad. But I didn't disagree with his reasoning on that. I more so was just like, yeah, but by this reasoning, every president in our history probably should have been impeached. And maybe that's true. Maybe they all have broken the law and, and they all are criminals. And that's, you know, I'm not going to be a hard audience to convince on that. But this does just seem like really getting into the weeds. Like, but on the other hand, I don't feel sorry for Trump because you didn't pardon Julian Assange. You didn't pardon Edward Snowden. You didn't pardon any of their whistleblowers who often are also convicted or being prosecuted for having classified documents or, or you know releasing information within them so i the whole thing feels like a stretch but also kind of not that unjust i guess is Trump's also I'm not a whistleblower like he kept these things for personal mementos and to brag and show people like there's literally a video apparently there's a tape of him telling somebody this is top secret i could have declassified it but i didn't so it's still top secret i shouldn't be showing you this but i will <laughs> like what, what is it is it stuff on aliens like what's in the documents do we even oh, know no. there's yeah some of the documents and that's the thing it's not like we have an over classification problem right Ta yeah. but this doesn't really appear to be at play in this case it was stuff about like our nuclear attack strategies of our allies it was stuff about like inv like it, it, war plans against iran information about our ally like um 
it was like actually things that should be confidential that he took with him and was showing people at Mar-a-Lago like, LOL. And yes, we can play the game of like, well, Joe Biden had documents in his in his garage next to his Corvette. And frankly, I think they're all trash, but it's particularly and I think what might get Trump, honestly, is the obstruction, the way he like, like just lied and said, I didn't have any documents. And then apparently, I mean, he but then again, Hillary smashed phones with hammers and deleted emails. And yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a hot mess. So we won't get into it for for too much here today because you guys have already probably heard about ad nauseum and we don't have anything particularly yeah. unique to add. But I just say I wouldn't want to be. uh I wouldn't want to be in Donald's shoes at the moment. Well, one thing I will add that I think is interesting, I saw somebody on Twitter say, by the way, over 99% of federal um, charges end up, they end up being convicted. And I want to point out that that is true. And that is because the vast majority of people do not get a trial. Most of these kinds of cases get pled out. Um, obviously, I don't think Trump's will get pled out. But it is, once you become charged federally, it's uh, not looking good for you. What so. an entertaining trial that would be. Oh my gosh. I, I don't hope it's televised. It. <laughs> I don't want to go through it, honestly. I hope this just goes away quickly because it really does. The just people like... versus Donald J. Trump, the next <laughs> Netflix special or whatever. I mean, comedic gold, I'm sure. But it just, everything oh, yeah. about this sucks the energy out of the room. And per usual, I just wish we were talking about more important things but anyways and we we're have some focus more on something things. that is yeah. much more important and that is the biggest taxpayer ripoff of our lifetimes i think um uh, certainly of my lifetime I, I just can't think of anything worse than this and uh this is of course the massive multi-trillion dollar covid outlay that happened under democrats and republicans supposedly to you know stimulate the economy mostly just stimulated inflation and turns out fraudsters and scammers engaged in truly unprecedented amounts of profiteering and grifting off these hastily produced programs uh, a new AP investigation, it's just a bombshell. It just blows the lid off this whole thing. I've reported on this for a long time now, but this is the most damning finding yet. Take a listen to this video uh, the AP put out as a part of their report. Imagine walking into a store, loading up your cart, and then strolling right out without being stopped. That's pretty much what happened to a lot of the COVID-19 pandemic aid. But what we didn't know until now is just how much fraudsters pocketed. Since the start of the pandemic, the U.S. government has allocated over $5 trillion in aid. The Associated Press found about $280 billion may have been stolen, and another $123 billion went to those who didn't qualify. That's more than $400 billion of taxpayer money gone. Let's go back to our imaginary store. It has a dozen checkout lines, each representing a federal agency overseeing a COVID relief program. There's one for small businesses, another for unemployment benefits, a separate line for stimulus checks, another for health care providers, among others. To keep the economy going, the cashiers were told to focus on speed rather than making sure customers don't slip out of the store with stolen items. In the case of COVID relief oversight, the government agencies did very little to no vetting of applicants. This lack of oversight opened the floodgates for fraudsters. They submitted a flood of fake applications and used stolen identities to apply for benefits in multiple states. They even impersonated healthcare providers, stealing funds meant for helping those treating COVID-19 patients. Webs of organized crime groups also got into the act. They bought reams of personal information on Americans to fuel their schemes. The U.S. government has recouped some of the stolen and improperly distributed cash, but three years after COVID shut down the world, Officials are still trying to figure out who was responsible for stealing so much money or clawing back cash that was improperly sent to so many others. Watchdogs can see most of it is gone, lost in the great grift. So the opening right out the gate when they say, imagine you're shopping in a store and you leave and you don't pay and nobody stops you kind of made me LOL because that currently seems to be the policy of many stores, especially in places like San Francisco, where they actually are told not to stop people anymore. But uh, anyway, it's just interesting, but uh, we we knew this was going to happen. I don't know what else to say. We knew it was going to happen. We said it was going to happen. It happened, and nothing's going to be done about it. It makes me feel kind of stupid for being so ethical and just you know not taking advantage of the system throughout the pandemic, not getting in on the grift because I got my measly like twelve hundred dollars stimulus check, kept working the whole time, and now I have to pay for all the inflation created by the stimulus spending. 
and all these other people were out getting rich off the idiotic policies of our of our lawmakers and taxpayer dollars and it's this i mean when they want to know why did people not show up and go back to work i think because a lot of them were were grifting off the system and a whole lot of money were able to not work anymore oh absolutely uh and let me just uh break this down for you in even starker detail so uh, this AP investigation finds that but there was um, $280 billion in fraud. That is just an astounding amount of taxpayer money. And then $123 billion that was misspent or outright wasted. And of course, these are all conservative estimates with a small C, like they're, they're going to grow. Um, but that means that combined, more than $400 billion was stolen or wasted. That is actually more than the government spent on health care during the pandemic. The federal government spent to develop the vaccines, the provider relief fund. Actually, on the health care part of the pandemic, they spent about $350 billion. So to me, that is just the federal government in a nutshell. They literally, they spent $4.2 trillion, which is more than the inflation-adjusted cost of FDR's New Deal. And they... Um, only 350 billion actually went to healthcare. Actually went to address the pandemic, and they lost more than 400 billion, so more than healthcare to fraud and waste. It's just wow. I mean, it confirms all of my prior beliefs about the federal government. I, but still, I'm still shocked. Yeah, I mean, even as the video says, they had so little protocols in place to guard against the the obvious fraud that was going to be attempted when you're handing out this kind of money. And I just. I, I often really do work hard to put myself in the shoes of people who think differently than me. But when it comes to people who support the government, when they support progressive ideas, they support a lot of spending, I I just don't understand how you can look at things like this and continue to not see massive holes in all of your ideas and plans because this was inevitable. This was not a fluke. This is how government functions. This was so predictable. This happens time and time again. Anytime we have something like this occur, I, I just truly don't understand how you can look at it and continue to believe that the government helps people, that it can adequately allocate resources, that it is not prone to just a complete mess of waste, fraud and abuse. And, you know, the, the free market and even the nonprofit world, they don't get everything right, but you would never see something like this outside of the government, maybe within Black Lives Matter, the organization. <laughs> like, well, that's the thing. One of my favorite Milton Friedman quotes is where he talks about the difference between how people spend their money and how the government spends their money. Because when I spend money on myself, right, I have an incentive to like shop wisely, to be careful with my money. Even when I spend money on you or I spend your money on me, I still have some incentive to like get a good deal or not waste. But what the government is actually responsible for doing is spending other people's money on other people. So, of course, they're not incentivized to be particularly careful with how they spend it or allocate it. I mean, that oh, there's just the incentives aren't there and everything in economics comes down to incentives. So let's go through in a little more detail exactly how the fraud went down. Uh, so this is from the Associated Press. Fraudsters used the social security numbers of dead people and federal prisoners to get unemployment checks. Cheaters collected those benefits in multiple states, and federal loan applicants weren't cross-checked against a Treasury Department database that would have raised red flags about sketchy borrowers. All of it led to the greatest grift in U.S. history, with thieves plundering billions of dollars in federal COVID-19 relief aid intended to combat the worst pandemic in a century and to stabilize an economy in free fall. And in fact, uh, specifically, so um, not all the programs were equally bad when it came to fraud and waste. So for example, the stimulus checks were the least bad. They got about 99% accuracy. And even then they still sent billions of dollars to dead people and random foreign citizens. And but people it was, in jail, right? Did they also send it to like convicts in jail? I don't know about, off the top of my head. I'm I'm not sure about that one, but I know they sent them to dead people and I know they sent them to random foreign citizens in other countries, received stimulus checks who, who weren't Americans, weren't U.S. citizens. Um, but still, like most of the money got to where it was supposed to go. The biggest uh, programs were the Paycheck Protection Program. The business loan, the other business loan programs, and then the unemployment benefits were the ones that were just rife with fraud. And here's why: 
in the, again, quoting from AP, in the haste to get money out the door, guardrails to protect federal money were dropped. Prospective borrowers were allowed to self-certify that their loan applications were true. And the CARES Act barred the Small Business Administration from looking at tax return transcripts that could have weeded out shady or undeserving applicants. A decision eventually reversed at the end of 2020. So they were so desperate to get the money out there, the politicians, that they literally told the, the you almost, I mean, you still can blame them, but you almost can't blame the bureaucrats and administrators in the federal government because they were told by Congress not to check the database of sketchy borrowers to not give money to, not to check tax returns, and to just allow people to self-certify that what they were saying about them qualifying was true. I mean, that's like almost beyond parody. I, I, I'm shell-shocked by that, honestly. I mean, I know that there were, one, none of this had to happen, right? If you don't come in and shut down the economy, none of this has to happen in the first place. People would have figured out how to take the best precautions they could have, keep doing their jobs, keep their businesses open, and we could have kept moving along. What they did in response to the pandemic was absolutely worse than the disease itself. They completely rushed head on ahead. And I think that, you know, I don't know what the excuse is for Republicans who went along with this. I think mostly because they would get called like, you know, they would say, you don't care about people. You don't care about suffering people. You don't care people. Grandma Grandma killer. Grandma killer. And like they folded. But the Democrats had an agenda here, right? Many of them did. They wanted to shut down businesses. They wanted to force people onto um, living off the federal government. They wanted to use this to get things like UBI, to cancel student debt, to cancel rent. They wanted to make everybody get unhealthy. I mean, they had big plans when it came to the response to the pandemic. And a lot of it did focus on pushing people out of work and making them dependent on the government. And so I think that it is uh, not surprising at all that that was their agenda and their goal. But what makes me so frustrated with Republicans is like they didn't stand in the gap. I mean, it was really just Thomas Massey, to my recollection, that came out when all of the stimulus stuff started and was like, absolutely not. This is a terrible idea. And even Trump went after him and they tried to threaten him with a primary and, and all kinds of things. But he was absolutely correct. And it, you know, it just spiraled from there. I, I think that it is unacceptable that this was what was done there's no, and now also not only did they do this they have no way of clawing any of it back they have no way of once everything's done the disaster's over going back through their records and looking through and saying okay this person got money they shouldn't have we're going to come back and collect it or we're going to charge you for filing false information it, that just blows my mind you the government they have um, left and so right they, you don't have records they have tried to to get back a little bit of the money, but most of it is gone and will never be recovered. Like they have got fees or what? They just don't know where it is. Yeah, mostly just they don't know where it is because people file with incorrect identities and you don't know who the real person is, um, and the money's just gone and uh, without a trace. I mean, some my favorite story though. A few some people have been busted. Uh, like this one guy, this rapper Nuke Bizzle, made a rap song about how he was ripping off unemployment, COVID checks, and he went to jail. Because he thought he could just rap about doing crime and not have anyone notice. Like he admit he confessed explicitly in the song, and I, I'm like, so if you if you were that level of bad at doing crime, they will have caught you maybe and gotten some of the money back. But most of it is gone to never be recovered, and a lot of people are getting away. I think it's it's pretty amazing because like government officials almost never admit any wrongdoing. <laughs> Right. They will be like they will just gaslight gatekeep girl boss out all day, try to to defend their actions. But they are basically holding their hands up. I mean, one government official quoted in the AP story says uh, that the covid spending was a quote, a sort of an endless pot of money that anyone could access. Meanwhile, the uh, Justice Department's acting director for COVID-19 fraud enforcement admitted to, quote, an unprecedented amount of fraud. And yet the most shocking statement came from the uh, Department of Justice's Inspector General Michael Horowitz. He says, if you open the bank window and say, give me your application and just promise me you really are who you say you are, you attract a lot of fraudsters. And that's what happened here. So it's back to the AP's initial analogy of just letting people come in with shopping carts and take whatever they want and just stream through the checkout lines with no verification or payment 
and you and I are on the hook for it in worsened inflation that's bankrupting all of us, in trillions of dollars more in debt that will hang around our necks economically for the rest of our lifetimes. And I think it is just an absolute disgrace. Yeah, I think if you are this wrong, this colossally wrong, you should have to never be in charge again. Like, I think every we should just have like a reckoning where we get to clean house and push all these people out of public service forever. I would love to see that kind of like claw back in the Constitution. <laughs> we Keep dreaming, that. though. Say what? Keep dreaming. Oh, yeah, I know. But I'm just saying if, if we lived in any kind of a common sense world, that would be part of this package. You You shouldn't get to be this absolutely wrong and correct and completely negligent and continue to be in charge of anything but nothing's going to change i you know the i was thinking about this the morning on the way to the gym the the data just keeps pouring in when it comes to covid and we're just everybody on the right is just completely validated time after time after time after time and yet i bet the vast majority of people on the left who supported these things don't even see these studies don't aren't even aware of this kind of data have no clue about all of the detrimental effects that were done as a as a repercussion of the policies that they got behind and therefore nothing really will change this could be a great learning opportunity i think for our country and for many americans but because of the echo chambers that we're in i have you know a lot of doubt that it's even going to break through the noise and get in front of the people who do need to be confronted with these kinds of failures yeah i think that doubt is well placed uh to me the final nail in the coffin before we move on of all of this covid fraud is that it basically went to to fund programs that didn't work. So I I hold the view, and this is what Justin Amash and some other people were saying, uh, that the the least bad part of the stimulus was giving people checks um, because as a form of compensation for just like taking away their their income and their livelihood, just like direct cash transfers. But all these programs, the Paycheck Protection Program, for example, ended up being a disaster. So in MIT analysis found that most of the money, the point of PPP was supposed to be to give businesses who were being closed under lockdowns um, money so they could keep their employees uh, employed and not have to lay people off. Yet an MIT economist, his analysis found that most of the money went to preserve jobs that would have been kept anyway, and that the PPP ended up spending 170000 to 257000 taxpayer dollars per job it actually saved which is literally way more like two, three, four times what these jobs pay in annual salary. And that's what taxpayers were paying. Now, meanwhile, these, they supercharged these unemployment benefits. So you could earn the equivalent of like $25, $20 an hour uh, weekly checks for months and months and months staying at home, more than a lot of people could earn by working. Uh, and that was supposed to be economic stimulus by depressing the labor force. Now they would say, cause it stimulates consumer spending or whatever, but in reality, millions of people admitted to pollsters. <laughs> yeah, um, we're not working cause we have enough checks from unemployment. So why would we go back to work? And that's just who admitted it. You can assume there's more who wouldn't admit it to pollsters. So that literally ended up constraining act. The Paycheck Protection Program was horrible stimulus extremely costly and very ineffective. And then the unemployment benefits, these are the two biggest things in the stimulus, actually were negative for the economics, for, for economic recovery. So all this fraud, this biggest ripoff of our lifetimes for taxpayers in exchange for worse inflation and pathetic economic stimulus results. Well, it was, I mean, it was a recipe for inflation 101. You constricted the labor supply. So you had fewer goods and services available on the marketplace. And then you gave those same people who weren't working a ton of extra money to sit home and shop. So then they're spending a lot more money. And that obviously creates inflation where prices skyrocket. You don't have to be a genius to see how these kinds of things are going to play out. And that's why you saw many people in the libertarian camp warning that this would be the end result all along. And yet, we were called grandma killers and said that we didn't care about poor people and like all the usual BS. No, we actually do care about people on the margins. And we understand that getting free money from the government is not really going to be good for you in the long term. And it's it, you're going to end up spending a whole lot more on in inflation down the road. And it's going to eat away your savings. And I'm just so I really, really, really do think like a great initiative for people to come together on and work on, you know, is to try to get some kind of financial literacy curriculum in high schools in this country, because it is just so lacking. And I really think that 
there shouldn't have been the mass support for these things to begin with. And and anytime the government creates a job, we see this with corporate welfare too, you better bet they're always going to spend at least double of what the position actually pays. The government cannot create jobs efficiently. It is never going to be good in that role. You need to give people the money themselves. I also was fine with the direct checks um, compared to everything else because I do think one taxpayers spend a whole lot of money and most of them get very little back for it, including me. So really, if you're going to get a little bit of your taxpayer money back, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, but secondarily, it was a it was a better approach because you're giving money to the individual and the individual can best make decisions with how to allocate those dollars that make the most sense for their specific situations. Um, everything else about this was just completely detached from economics. And Again, I, I'm so frustrated by it because we are we're still living with it, and I and we still don't even know what the end result's going to be. Like it's been bad enough for the past year with inflation, but it could keep spiraling. The the money problem is a real issue in this country, and it is threatening to our future. And I'm just really fed up with our elected representatives not taking that threat more seriously. And I don't know. So sometimes- um, one thing that I did see that was heartening to me is. Uh, recently, I don't remember exactly, but pretty recently, the money supply actually started going down. So the Fed, by raising rates and it's complicated and whatever, um, the M2, the supply of dollars in the economy has started decreasing. So I think it will take a while, but that could mean that the inflation, because we've still had consistent like 5% inflation and this it compounds and it really is harmful to people. Um I, I could, I think, start to abate and I hopefully not keep just just become the new normal. I don't think it will. I Fingers crossed. But um, all right, we will leave it there on that one. Let us know in the comments what you how you feel about your money being spent like this. Hey, guys, Brad here. I just want to make sure you're staying in the loop on all things based politics. We've also got two new shows you should check out. One is my new show, Damage Control, where I'm teaming up with right of center LGBT guests to restore sanity on these increasingly unhinged issues. Then there's Hannah's show, Copaganda, where she's reacting to videos of police brutality and exposing the systemic flaws in the US criminal justice system. Check these all out on our individual Facebook and YouTube pages. And remember, Base Politics is a nonprofit organization, so you can help us move the culture through content by going to base-politics.com and donating today. And now let's turn to our quick hits section. So up first, I want us to react to and discuss a clip of Joe Biden's new CDC director, who apparently thinks that like extreme government intrusion and authoritarianism is like funny and, and just LOL, and basically admitted that her decisions were not rooted in science. So the backstory is that Biden has picked Mandy Cohen to uh, succeed Rochelle Walensky as the next CDC director. And Mandy Cohen was the head of the North Carolina Health and Human Services Department uh, it, during the pandemic. And she apparently gave a very candid remarks about how she followed the science to come up with her COVID restrictions about what people were and were not allowed to do. Take a listen to this clip. So I would call, probably the person I called most was the Secretary of Health and Human Services in Massachusetts. She worked for a Republican governor just to, um, but you know, when she was like, are you, are you gonna let them have professional um, uh, football? And I was really like, nope. And she's like, okay, neither are we, neither are we. Uh, <laughs> so um, so uh, you know, it was like conversations like that. So, or, or I'd be like, so when are you gonna think about lightening up a mess? They were like, so like, next Monday. I'm like, okay, next Monday. <laughs> So I was pretty disturbed by the kind of casual laughter with which she discusses, like letting people be free. Like, Haha, are you going to let them have professional football? LOL. No, like that is just such a, a petty level of like authoritarianism. You're just so casually tossing around the fact that you're going to restrict people's freedom and take away the things that make them happy. And you think it's like funny or cutesy and you're just gal you're like gabbing with your gal pals who are the authoritarians in the other states like oh my gosh she comes across as like a creepy masochist in this video and for all intents and purposes the cdc and other health agencies within the government are supposed to be nonpartisan. now we know that that's not true but i mean good grief like with the brazenness that she displays this it's actually quite breathtaking you're just joking around about how you were politicizing 
decisions that affect people's long-term life, their academic success, their relationships, their employment, their mental health. There is nothing funny about this whatsoever. What the CDC did to people during COVID is not a laughing matter. It's something that there needs to be accountability for. These kind of people should actually have to answer for the decisions they made, especially when they were completely divorced from the science and were being made on political grounds, which we know a lot of them were. They were behind the scenes um, getting together with people like Randy Weingarten with the teachers union to make their decisions and then claiming they were based on science. No, they were always based on politics. If she wants to come out and say this publicly, that's great. I would love to then take it a step further and, and push her for just how many of these decisions were based on those kinds of metrics versus the actual science. And I think that that's something that should preclude her from ever being able to be in charge of this kind of agency. And I don't know, do they vote on her? Does she have to get approved for this or he could just install her? I think the Senate will have to vote to confirm her. I'm not a positive on that, but I'm pretty sure. So I hope they don't. I hope they roadblock yeah, her because think about think about the second part of the video too. She's she's the head of the North Carolina agency. She's chatting with a Massachusetts person and she's making the decision about when to ask and mask mandates. Remember, this is the follow the science crowd. And she just said that she made it by chatting with a representative from another state asking them when they were going to do it and just copying that. Ha ha ha. We'll do Monday too then. Like this is what following the science looks like. This is what trusting the experts looks like. I don't know. I just find the whole thing demented. And the idea that you could be so obviously like bad at your job, you're supposed to be a nonpartisan uh, scientific health expert and then get promoted from the state gig to the national leader. I mean, that just... It, this government in a nutshell, huh? They just keep failing up. And I think that there's this, I, it makes me so mad how flippant people are about the mask mandates now. They're just like, oopsie. No, not oopsie. There was never anything to back this up. And you put them on small children. You actually made it to where small children are going to have learning delays because they need to see people's mouths and lips to learn how to speak. So you're giving kids the need to go see speech pathologists now because of that, right? You, you also did it all the way through schools, you gave kids depression issues. You gave me cystic acne. I had to go on Accutane because I got such bad acne from masks. I was getting these massive cysts on my chin. They were super painful. That obviously hurt my mental health. And then I had to go on Accutane, which is a very powerful medication that makes you suicidal for six months. These kinds of things should not be taken lightly. I, it really actually pisses me off that they did this to us and made it to where you couldn't go around in polite society. You couldn't go to a gym. You couldn't work out. You couldn't do a number of things that were good for you because of these mask mandates. And now they're like, huh, fun times. <sighs> disgusting. Nope. Absolutely Terrible. Disgusting. Hey guys, Hannah here. Big things are happening at Base Politics and we want to make sure you stay in the loop with all of our productions and developments. If you like the Base Politics podcast, you can find it every Wednesday morning on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Brad's YouTube. You want to support the show? Be sure to join the Base Politics Locals channel where you can help produce it for only $5 a month. You can also catch our new shows, Copaganda and Damage Control, every Saturday on our respective YouTubes and Facebook channels. On Damage Control, Brad teams up with Right of Center LGBT guests to restore sanity to the increasingly unhinged debate over these issues. And on Copaganda, I'm taking video footage of police behaving badly every week and using those videos to expose problems within U.S. policing and the laws that guide it. Remember, Base Politics is a nonprofit organization dedicated to moving the culture through content. If you want to be a part of these efforts, you can donate to fund our work at base-politics.com. All right. Well, on to our next quick hit. Brad, have you ever seen the movie or read the book Eat, Pray, Love? I think this is a pretty- No, but I have heard of it, but I've never watched it or, or read it. Okay. Well, this is a smash hit in Girl World. You know what? I've actually never seen it either. And several of our friends, Maggie and Sarah, have been after me to watch it. So I'm going to have to see it soon. But- the author of it um, became quite successful, and she's done other things since then, and apparently had a new book that she was getting ready to release. But she has actually canceled her own book after she faced bullying online from people who claim to be Ukrainians who are upset that the book was set in early 1900s in Russia. Let's listen to her clip she put on Twitter explaining her decision. Hi, everybody. It's Liz, and I have an announcement to make. So last week, I announced the um, upcoming publication of my most recent novel, a book called The Snow Forest, that was set in the middle of Siberia in the middle of the last century and told the story of a group of individuals who made a decision to remove themselves from society, to resist the Soviet government, and to try to defend nature against industrialization. 
But over the course of this weekend, I have received an enormous, massive outpouring of reactions and responses from my Ukrainian readers, expressing anger, sorrow, disappointment, and pain about the fact that I would choose to release a book into the world right now, any book, no matter what the subject of it is, that is set in Russia. And I wanna say that I have heard these messages and read these messages and I respect them. And as a result, I'm making a course correction and I'm removing the book from its publication schedule. It is not the time for this book to be published. And um, I do not want to add any harm to a group of people who have already experienced and who are all continuing to experience grievous and extreme harm. Um, so that is the choice that I have made. And I've got other book projects that I'm working on and I've made a decision to turn my attention to working on those now. So I just wanted to let everybody know that and thank you very much. So I guess I'm glad that the Ukrainian people who are suffering bombs, bullets through their houses, deaths of loved ones, at least will not have to suffer the pain and horror of having a new book come out that is set in Russia. What? What on earth? I. This is just such a, a weird story, for one. This these it was probably like a hundred people before being it was probably just randos on Twitter who claimed to be offended by this. Uh, and I have a hard time believing that any of them are actually Ukrainians, because if your country is being invaded and there's human rights abuses going on and war and violence, are you going to be on Twitter pressed about the fact that some book is being published that takes place in 1900s Russia? I mean, to say nothing of the fact that the book she says is literally about resisting the Soviets. It's so it's an anti-Russian imperialist book and they're still mad. And, and the, but so I have two things. One, this whole thing is absurd. The whole backlash is absurd. And I doubt it was really very widespread, but two, what a pathetic excuse for an artist. This woman is, I, I, we've seen this a lot lately artists self-censoring their work because people get angry or offended even if it's a time like taylor swift did this not too long ago she censored one of her music videos because people were upset it was fat phobic or something and it's like five people on the internet get mad and you compromise the integrity of your artwork then clearly you were never that invested you never truly believed what you were creating in all that much and it's just a shame it's a real act of moral cowardice to kowtow to these irrational fringe mobs and compromise the most sacred and sacrosanct aspects of your art and your craft and your creativity um, at the altar of these woke people that will frankly never like you, you'll never make them happy. They'll it'll never be good enough for them. Uh, so it's it's a losing endeavor, and it's deeply depressing to me that this is actually where our supposed creative luminaries are at these days. The, the hard reality is you can never cower enough to satisfy the crazies. If you give these people an inch, they're going to take a mile. The only thing you can do is shut them down and push them back into the seedy corners of the internet that they crawled out of. You're absolutely right that this was not massive backlash. One, just because, like, who even is paying that close of attention to whatever new book this woman's writing? Like, you know, she's probably got 20,000 fans or so. They're, like, really interested, if that. I mean, I just, I am with you. I don't really buy that these are actually... Ukrainians. I think these are very, very online bored, empty people with way too much time on their hands. And it reminds me of the Ukrainian mob that came after me when I posted some anti-war content a couple weeks ago, which we actually talked about on the show because it was such a weird, very online, very coordinated sort of response that was just seedy and weird. And anyways, I bet it was these same people if I had to guess. But uh, in the article that I found on this incident, they said over the weekend, over 500 people gave the book one star on the book review platform, Goodreads. Many of the reviewers said they were, Uca were Ukrainian and were worried that the book would romanticize Russia at a time when the country is accused of committing war crimes. So, it's an anti-Soviet book. And it's so over over 500 people. Like that's, that's really... Also, they're reviewing a book they haven't read because it hasn't been released. Yeah. That is messed up. 
Right. And the fact that she <laughs> bowed to this is just, it makes her as crazy as them, honestly. I mean, the book is set in a different time period. It's it's anti-Russia. And even if it were not, it is, it is not the case that because Russia is doing things that we don't like right now and are bad, that you can never say anything positive about Russia or Russians any time in the past. Like, this is just an absurd way of approaching things these are children i just it really does annoy me that an artist would behave in this way and give in like if anything for me i'd be like i'm gonna put even more money behind it just to stick it to you guys but no she instead like worked for a long time on this book i can presume and other people behind the scenes i bet put a lot of work into it and now she's just going to take a financial hit because she's a coward and i people have got to learn stop bowing to the mob it doesn't make it better it won't put us into it. They will never be satisfied. You have to learn to stand up to these people. They're just bullies. And they're not even good bullies at that. They're bullies who hide behind anonymous profiles. I can't fathom caring what these kinds of people think. If you aren't, you know, on level enough to have an actual name and profile pic attached to your social media, I don't think you're that valuable, valuable of a member of society to where I should care about your opinion. I just don't. I just don't come out of your mom's basement and say it to people's face. Like, and if you can't, then please move along and let us like get about and join our lives because these people will suck every bit of joy out of society. If they can, they will, compl they will continue to ruin art. We've seen this throughout many oppressive regimes in the past. Art's one of the first things to go because it is so expressive and that's, that's why they hate it. Right. They want to be able to control the artist. And once you get to that point in a society where you can, it's not a, it's not a good position to be in. So I think that this is uh, very discouraging because it is part of a larger trend. Taylor Swift, as you mentioned, we covered Beyonce doing something similarly. We've seen a lot of comedics do this. So I, I, I really think this is something that we should be kind of wary of and concerned about. It's, it's funny to me because the people doing this think they're like uh, the opposite of Putin. <laughs> but they're actually kind of behaving a little bit like Putin, right? Like t yeah. the, Putin locks up journalists and censors voices and everything. And when you're trying to get books unpublished, you're not the good guy. I don't know how to explain that to you. Like you're not the champion of liberal democracy you think you are. You're mm -hmm. just not. I mean, the whole thing is demented. These people need to touch grass and artists need to grow a spine. I yeah. think wokeness is increasingly a... Um, a virus that like corrodes your vertebrae it like makes them it turns you the vertebrae the bones in your back into mush and <laughs> that's what we're witnessing with people like this woman and ugh, i just i think it is going to i hope it burns itself out but it, for right now it just seems like it's getting worse and worse yeah it really truly does and i think you're right the book burners throughout history can't really think of a time they've been on the right side of it it's just it's never you're probably never on the side of freedom and expression and, and actual goodwill if you're if you're taking to that extreme. And this is kind of just another form of book burning right through the Internet. So, all right, we've got to move on to our next quick hit. Brad, do you think that wealthy people just want others to suffer? Well, I know I want other people to suffer, but I'm not wealthy. So, <laughs> well, according to this TikToker, that is the massive plan going on behind the scenes in the U.S. Let's roll this clip. Do you want to know why the wealthy class really don't want us to have healthcare and education like most other first world countries do? Countries less rich than ours have citizens that just get given education and healthcare. Not ours. It's because they want to keep the citizens in this country desperate. People who are desperate for education, for healthcare, for the basics, they're much more easily exploitable. People who don't owe $80,000 in student loans, people who don't have to pay an ungodly amount of money for health insurance every month, they're not as easy to exploit because they have much less to lose. Do you know how many people in this country keep their jobs particularly because they need the health care or because their student loans and their debt is so high that they need to be employed to pay that debt back? And the system just goes round and round and round. And three major groups of people have all homogenized into one single circle jerk. And at the top, there are neither Democrats or Republicans. There are the rich. And they all get along just fine, let me tell you that. And what they trickle down out of all their corporations and with all their money and power is the illusion of choice. Let me give you a few examples. We like to believe that we can choose our health insurance. But have you ever noticed that every single health care plan is essentially just the same? It's a high premium and they cover nothing. Car insurance, same thing. Go to the grocery store. You have so many things to choose from, but they're all owned by like four or five companies. You can go to any college you want, but for the most part, you're going to get an education that tells you that you should be spit right back out into the system and go get a job, be a cog in the wheel. Oh, and by the way, you owe us $120,000. 
My point is, no matter what you choose, no matter where you go, no matter which selection you make, the outcome is essentially the same. But they want us to believe that there's an illusion of choice, because as long as you're choosing, you're free. But we're not free when all the choices are exactly the same. Brad, I I can't explain how I felt watching this video other than like sheer joy because she's just stumbling all around the main point and still not hitting it. And it's like you are actually calling out so many of the issues that people on the right are also concerned about. But ironically, they're the issues that people on the right and many wealthy donors are trying to fix, like trying to get you out of the indoctrination of of school. She's sitting here complaining about higher ed and being indoctrinated by it. And it's like, yeah, the left has taken over academia for decades now. She's complaining about high insurance premiums and not getting much in return. It's like, yeah, the left has made it where you have to be on these insurance plans and they ruined them. With Obama She's complaining care. about Obamacare. Yeah. You're mad about progressive policies that have been put into place. You're mad that your health insurance is, is attached to your job. Who do you think came up with that? Not it's Republican. literally government regulation that you mu that employers must provide health care. That's what the, the the healthcare market never emerged like that until that regulation, and that's why people feel trapped to their job for their health care because of a government regulation. I mean, I felt gaslit by this video. One, she's like, she's she's describing this mythical America where we have no welfare state, like this rugged capitalist society where if you don't get health care or anything. I'm sorry. Has ma'am never heard of Medicaid? Has ma'am never heard of food stamps? Has she never heard of the Obama phones? Like you can literally get without working if you're poor, government health care paid for by the taxpayer. There already is that for people that can't afford it. You get Pell Grants to go to college if you are poor. I mean, there is all sorts of things that are there for people already and yet she's acting like they just don't exist because they want to keep us all poor and desperate and so they can exploit us uh which doesn't make any sense for too many reasons to count but i also i just have to take issue with the fact that she's pointing out a bunch of industries that have been messed up by the government like higher ed is the perfect example why is college so expensive it wasn't but then the federal government flooded it with almost blank check student loans that at a subsidized and unsubsidized rate. Um, and that jacked up the price by a ton. Then they started having these uh, government bureaucrats at these public colleges waste money and grow with the administrative state on campus. And they, they really are to blame in large part, the government for the high cost of college these days. And yet she's pointing that to a fact of how capitalism is leaving everyone desperate and how the rich are these, these evil cabal of, and, and also like her example at the grocery store is just like so wrong. You go into a grocery store, there are so many choices. I go to the ice cream aisle and there's 20 different kinds of ice cream because you know, food like groceries is actually a, a, a mostly free market in a lot of ways. Um, mm, well, I'll so back on that. Not on the production side, yeah. on the sale side. So, yeah. so obviously, food production is heavily regulated. But I mean, on the sale side, these prices are all allowed to come up and down. There's no price setting. Uh, there's food stamps for a small slice of society, but people are mostly paying out of pocket. There's no intermediary. Like an actual grocery store, commerce is a largely freeish market. Yeah. Food production is is another story. Um, but you have like you have a lot of competition among food brands. The idea that it's all just two or three companies that own everything in your grocery store is not true. Um, and in fact, food is very affordable in the United States. We have people who are too fat and eat too much. Uh, it, it's we do not have a I mean, there are some cases, sure. But the problem is not that people aren't getting fed in America, right? Because the rich want us hungry to keep us desperate. The problem is that we're uh, it, it, eating a little too much. Well, she had so many flawed points. I mean, one, the idea that you are less desperate or less dependent if you are getting all of your essential services from the government makes absolutely no sense. And that was sort of her premise. Furthermore, I can't stand when people point to these other countries to get all these things, blah, 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 blah. And they've done zero research into the realities of that. Yes, smaller countries do provide things like health care and some student loans and things like that. But I found in my research that the average student debt in these countries is still around $20,000 per year because they still have to pay for living costs. So yes, you get cheaper college, but guess what? You could actually do college much cheaper here. You don't have to go 
to an expensive school. You can still find schools where you can go for four or $5,000 a year that's perfectly manageable. These are choices that you make and the kinds of education that you want to pursue. When it comes to health care, yes, they get basic health care, but many of them have to carry additional insurance policies and come to the U.S. to get basic services because the so they're on long waiting lists. Health care is being rationed over there and they can't actually get basic services or surgeries in a timely manner before they die. So I'm really tired of that narrative. It's absolutely bogus. And furthermore, I, go, I think you're going to see systems like England's fall very, very, very soon. So if you're not paying attention to that, please don't run your mouth about the U.S. health care system because you really don't know what you're talking about. I would agree that you should not have to be tied to insurance plans. I agree that the insurance market is very, very crappy in the U.S. But again, that traces back to government policies that the left has forced on the American people like Obamacare. Meanwhile, the wealthy people I know are pushing for things like direct primary care, telehealth expansion, deregulating health care, trying to get these things out of the way and make it more affordable for you. So you're mad at the wrong people. And I, I just think that she continues to have this idea that like the rich are after you no i don't think that's the case in fact i've seen most of the rich have a lot of like guilt for being wealthy and often are found on the left or if you do find them on the right they're they're very involved in charity they're very involved in trying to fix things in the system to make them better for you so i if you're going to be mad at these things do the basic research of tracing back their origins you should know that having your health insurance tied to your job came from like fdr and unions. It didn't come from Republicans, right? And if you're mad about being indoctrinated into school systems, guess who's trying to break kids out of them? The right with things like school choice. And again, you're just mad at all the wrong people. You, you're identifying some correct problems, but you're not even you know, looking a little bit beneath the surface to figure out what's truly going on. And you're not doing enough research on other countries too, to know that while they might have some of these things paid for, they have far less disposable income than Americans because you have to pay for it. You're the middle class and the poor people. You still have to pay so much more money in taxes just to get those kinds of services that you have far less disposable income. And, and I don't think that that's a good trade-off for most people. If you ask me, do I want to pay 20% more of my income just to get health care and four years of school? No, that's a really bad trade-off. That doesn't actually make a lot of financial sense. So I, oh gosh, the fact that these people just come on TikTok and pop off and think that they're doing something and they just look so silly. And this is something like, seriously, if you're mad about something, do the basics to figure out what created the problem in the first place. You've got the internet right at your fingertips. It's literally in your pocket at all times. There's no excuse for being this uninformed. There's not. All right. Well, we've got one more quick hit I want to cover today. Brad, I think you're going to find this research I stumbled upon pretty interesting. So there's a new study that found good looking female students are no longer getting straight A's when their classes become virtual. Uh, according to this paper on it, it says the recent research in psychology published in the journal Economic Letters reveals that attractive students tend to achieve higher grades in school. However, the study suggests that this beauty premium disappears when classes are taught remotely, especially for female students. Numerous studies have indicated that physical appearance influences a person's success. Attractive people usually earn more money and report higher life satisfaction from their less attractive counterparts. However, scholars have yet to agree on the explanation uh, behind this beauty premium, as they call it. Um, they went on to say that the switch to online instruction eliminated the beauty premium for female students in non-quantitative courses. Attractive female students saw a decline in their grades with remote instruction. However, attractive male students continued to enjoy a beauty advantage. Um, Mayhick, who is the person behind this, this report, she stated that the main takeaway from the study is that there is a beauty premium for both males and females when teaching is in-person instruction. But for females, this effect disappeared when teaching was conducted online. This suggests that the beauty premium for males is due to some productive attributes, such as higher self-confidence, whereas discrimination causes the beauty premium for women. She went on to discuss several reasons why physical attractiveness might enhance productivity for male students noting that male students who are physically attractive tend to be more persistent and have a greater influence on their peers. Attractive people also tend to have more social skills, which have been linked to creativity. Since non-quantitative courses tend to involve creative assignments and group work, men who are more attractive might be more likely to excel in this coursework. But the study author did note that more research is needed to determine precisely why discrimination based on appearance happens. So I have some theories. I want to know what are your thoughts for why this beauty premium diminishes for women when they're not in person, but not for men? I don't know that part, but I can just say the beauty premium for men is very real. 
Um, I've benefited from it my entire life. I have a lot of guilt over it, but what can I say? I can't help it. I was just born this way, Hannah. Yeah, I know. You really have struggled with that a good bit. Um, I have a theory, and this is just my own you know, intuition in reading this. I think it's because, uh, how do I put this? For females being in person when they're attractive, I think for some professors, there's hope of an interaction maybe like male professors are more likely to give higher grades because they might think there's going to be something transactional going on or they hope to have a shot at actually sleeping with a woman whereas for men women might think they're attractive and flirt with them and rate them more highly but there's not that like expectation or sort of predatory kind of notion behind it i know that's dark but listen i've lived it i've known a lot of friends who have lived it with their male professors started in high school i i dealt with some of this kind of stuff Uh, I really did. I had one coach in particular. I look back and I'm like, somebody needed to search his computer. Um, but I, I think that, you know, they didn't dig into this in the study, but that's, that's my hot take on this, on this research. I think that it, I think she's absolutely wrong about like, well, when men are attractive, it leads to them having these different character traits and makes them more productive. That seems really sexist to me. Like, I don't, I don't think that that holds a lot of weight. Um, I do think being attractive can probably produce certain social skills that give you an edge. Like you probably are more likely to have confidence, to be outgoing, to be engaging, to be able to, you know, razzle dazzle your peers in a teamwork setting. But I can't imagine that that would not be true for women who are attractive as much as men. So I don't know. I thought her take seemed a little sexist towards women and overlooked what could be an actual kind of groundbreaking discovery if you wanted to poke the bear a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't have too many thoughts on it um, other than that I'm glad this area that has affected me so profoundly in life is finally getting the scientific attention that it deserves. Well, don't worry. Your beauty premium isn't going anywhere anytime soon, whether you're remote or in person, (laughs) since you are a man. All right, let's move on to our mailbag. First up, we have Sam Johnson, and he says, I have a request for a new feature on your show. Before reading quotes from Trad Post, you must give those of us who are driving in the car fair warning. I heard Hannah read the requirements of what a wife is supposed to be at the time I was driving through a construction zone on an interstate, started laughing so hard at the guy's attitude, and almost caused an accident. (laughs) We should give trigger warnings for the absolute crazy takes we read on here. I know, uh, but I don't believe in trigger warnings. Uh, (laughs) But so Kunal says dog owners are a bigger cult than the LGBT and religious right combined. Why do we orient our entire society to what is best for dogs, dot, dot, dot? Um, I smell a cat person. No, thank you. I smell Mm -mm. a psychopath. I mean, one, yes, we are absolutely a cult and I am not sorry one bit. We love dogs around here. Two, dogs make everything better. They should be allowed everywhere in society. I was talking to a woman at the dog park last week who's from Italy and she was complaining about how anti-dog America actually is and how in Europe you can take your dog everywhere and it's much more dog friendly. And I think that we actually have a lot further to go in this country because Honestly, people like this, the cat people, they're not going out anyways. They're in their homes being antisocial. So why should we structure society around them versus dogs? I rest my case. So Phil says, you delete comments. How are you different from the media? You don't want a debate. I wanted to address this. I don't usually delete comments. Um, I think that YouTube auto filters out some content, some comments if they, for whatever reason. I only delete comments when I see them explicitly calling for or celebrating violence or if they contain explicit slurs but i'm pretty uh, laid back on deleting comments yeah i got a notification from facebook last week that my quote quote virtual assistant who i've never met or heard of had hid 600 plus comments on my facebook that week and i was like for what What? what are people saying on my facebook so I, but I will block people who are mean and nasty, like real fast. I have no tolerance for somebody who can't behave like an adult on my page. I'm not going to take your abuse. I'm not going to let you abuse my followers. So you will get banned immediately if you come in there acting like a psycho and that will hide your comment. So if you want your comment to be seen, conduct yourself like a rational adult. Otherwise, not sorry. All right. Cereal Bowl (laughs) says the debt ceiling should be $0. Um... That, you know, I'm, I'm very, I'm very limited government, very anti-government spending as a whole. I don't think, I mean, that's basically anarchy, I guess is what you're saying, that there should be no government, no spending. I don't. Oh, no. The debt, that means no debt. Oh, no debt. Well, I mean, but 
I don't that know. means taxes, just paying for all your government spending. Paying for everything immediately. I guess I don't have tremendous pushback on that. I, I, I think, so for example, this gets you to the debate over balanced budget amendments. Mm-hmm. I like budget ba- uh, balanced budget amendments that are, um, what's the right way to describe this? They're not constantly flat, but it's like you must, the, ba- ba- the budget must be balanced uh, over 10 years. Or like, like it must even out. So you, so some years you can run a surplus and some a deficit. Cause for example, like I think even from a, a classical liberal perspective, there are occasions where you might need to run a deficit, a war and an invasion, also a recession. I, for example, would do massive tax holiday to stimulate economic activity. That's going to create a deficit, but then you can run a surplus in a year or two and you could have a balanced budget overall over the course of five or 10 years but i don't think you should have to have zero deficit zero budget flat all the time and so i think there there does probably need to be some leeway for the debt ceiling uh so i would say i appreciate the Mm -hmm. sentiment Mm -hmm. but i don't know if i'm on board with that suggestion through world war ii if i'm not mistaken that is what we did we ran deficits during world war ii and then we made up for it after wartime it wasn't until kennedy slash LBJ that we really started getting away from making up our debts, right? I think I'm right on that. Yeah, and then it blew up under Bush, <laughs> for, for real. Just did right. many things. All right, who's next? Um, uh, Churro oh, Thieve says, honestly, you gay men still don't know what misogyny is. You did one video pretending to care about women against trans men, then you do another vid jeering the whole group of women. Don't pretend you care. Misogyny runs really deep with gay men. So here's the thing. I think this is about our video reacting to those white libbed out women who like stormed the Colorado Capitol demanding gun control. I don't think that we were say, saying anything about all women, I think, or even all white women. I think we were pretty specific that this was one group of libs. Like, I don't think we were casting any aspersions about women overall. Same thing. I get this pushback that when I call people Karens, it's misogynistic. And I disagree with that because I call male people Karens because it's about a behavior pattern that, you know, perhaps stereotypically did originate from a white woman, but I've called, I really don't view it as inherently tied to that. I I view it as the, can I want to speak to the manager personality? It's really not about the sex or gender of the person. Yeah. Karen is a personality trait. Now I think I did say white women are becoming a menace last week, which is funny. And I can say that because I am a white woman. (laughs) I I do think some of us are really just off the rails, but no, I mean, this doesn't make any sense. I, I do think that this is being just, I don't get this at all. One, it's not misogynistic to criticize women as a group when women as a group are doing something. Like, that's not misogyny. If you're going to call out behavior for one group of people, then you can call it out for another. So I, I think that it's fine. Like, call a spade a spade. If white women are acting crazy in public, we can say that. And of course, we don't mean that all white women are doing it by half even. It's more of just sort of tongue in cheek. But I just think this is weird. I do hear this this threat or not threat, this like complaint lobbed against gay men a good bit though that they're misogynistic. And I'm, I don't see it. I have a ton of gay guy friends. I've never really understood that at all what i do take issue with is the number of straight men i see online bashing trans people claiming that they're doing it to protect us women and stand up for women meanwhile me and most women i know have never really had any issue with trans people or felt threatened by them whatsoever and those same men never seem to pop up when people like andrew tate or pearl actually are going after women so i just i don't know there's there's some things to unwind there but we have time for we don't have time for that today we'll move on okay bs says i just can't stand Hannah's whiny voice. Is there anything that can be done about that? Yeah, you can go away. <laughs> yeah, you can bleep like, off. Like, like go. Bye. Like, well, I, I, the number of people who will listen to your show or watch a video and then be like, who even cares about your opinion? It's like, well, you, because you sat there and watched what I was saying and then took time to comment on it. So clearly you do. Yeah. Well, just wow. I mean, um, honestly, just sexist too, because I have a pretty. The sex one is for you too. I have a pretty low pitched voice, so I don't really understand why you're going to call it. You actually have a good podcast voice. Sometimes I listen and I think your voice translates better to podcasting than mine does. Though I also think I have a decent podcast voice. I think the opposite. I think you have a really great podcast voice. But anyways, uh, loves to hug it out. Says, hey, Hannah, I didn't know you were a Christian. That's awesome. I am too. 
I just want to understand where you're coming from. Is God bad for his ways in the time of the Old Testament? Hasn't God always been holy, good, love, and the creator of all things? It's just so silly to me for God's very creation to tell the creator of our existence that what he does is wrong or bad. Do you think God made a mistake in his dealings in the Old Testament and should have known better? I think that God didn't write the Bible or the Old Testament at all. Humans did. And I have many, many issues with the Bible. And I think it is very subjective, very open to and, uh, you know, every person's uh, perspective when they read it. I think it's very influenced by the times it was written in and the culture it was written in. And I think it's got very, very little to do with um, with God at times. So I, I think that's my issues with the Bible. I have often said that I call myself a Christian because I was clearly raised Christian. I'm a, I am grew up in evangelical ink um, and culturally I'm very Christian. And I believe in modeling your life after the teachings of Jesus. I think that that's a great example to follow and live by. But I also know very, very well that many fundamentalists or even just people who are like uh, very um, specific in their denomination will take issue with my beliefs around Christianity because I certainly don't fall into the camp of beliefs around many of the mainline American um, Christian denominations. So you probably would take issue with some of my theology and that's okay. I'd probably take some issue with yours. I'll just sit that one out because uh, <laughs> no comment. Darth Joe Mo says, my God, Brad is handsome and intelligent. Think I found my new crush. Brad, um, and I would send people left and right on this podcast. I remember the other guy was like, Brad made me gay. And, yes. Um, and that this is definitely not my alt account. <laughs> This is so funny. All right. I wish I could flip somebody on the podcast. That's going to be my new goal. Well, let's move on to our what, hot take. What, 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 how would that work? Flip a gay guy to being straight? Conversion therapy some dude? <laughs> I don't know. Just, just I want somebody to change their sexual orientation for me because I'm so pretty. It's not fair. You keep doing it. I, I don't like think that. I do. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to hot takes that actually was not mine. So... My hot take this week is very controversial, but I stand by it and have for some time and is that more men should get vasectomies. Increasingly, we are learning more and more about the harmful effects of birth control, which has been pumped into everybody my age since they were preteens. Um, I have recently gone off of it and I'm actually quite frankly horrified that this was put into my body uh, throughout my childhood and teenage years and young adulthood. And really, I was never given very good information about it at all. Um, and I think too much of the burden of not getting pregnant falls on women in society and it's detrimental to us and our bodies and our mental health, especially. And I think men should have to carry more of the load, if you will. So I think, um, especially for men who, you know, don't want to have kids or who are done having kids, go get a vasectomy. There's, there's no reason you shouldn't. It's, it's an easy, simple procedure. If you want to have it reversed, even you can. It's much less invasive than having your tubes tied and does not have the harmful side effects on one's body that birth control does. So I think a lot of men should step up and step. All right, then. Uh, but I, I don't have to worry about these problems. So. so my hot take is that I might have been wrong about cucumbers. So I always hated cucumbers. I always thought they were so gross, but I've gotten into Greek food lately, like Mediterranean food. And I really like tzatziki sauce and I made it from scratch. And I realized it's basically like mushed up cucumbers with Greek yogurt. And I really like it. So I think I do like cucumbers or like maybe my tastes have just changed. How I, Isn't there something like your taste buds change every five years or something? But I used, but that also sounds like baloney to me, but, um, that sounds like pop science, you know, like yeah. just fake think, or like. I think it's more likely like you can acquire a new taste. Things can yeah. grow on you over time. Well, I think cucumbers may have grown on me. So I'm formally retracting my prior denunciation. I also think as is true with most fruits and vegetables, but especially fruits, um, it's all about the, the freshness of the product. Like I can really like a tomato or a cucumber here and there, but also you can get a really bad one. Also grapes been traumatized by grapes throughout my life you really just never know what's going to happen so uh, yeah i think cucumbers are pretty are pretty good but you gotta watch your back all right guys that's a wrap be sure to leave us a comment this week let us know your thoughts we'll read it on air be sure to subscribe to brad's channel and until next week stay based <laughs>